And Ukrainian President Zelensky now confirms there have been have been deadly clashes with North Korean troops in Russia's Kursk region. This news comes as Ukraine's push into Russian territory ter territory is stalled and as Ukraine is preparing for an uncertain future following Donald Trump's election victory. Trump has promised that he would end the war there quickly, but has also threatened to pull back on U.S. aid to Ukraine. So where does this leave all of this? Joining us right now is Georgetown University adjunct professor, former CNN Moscow bureau chief Jill Doherty, and Washington Post columnist Max Boot. It's great to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Max, what do you think this new Trump presidency means for Ukraine? How quickly do you think, how quickly do you think that the country sees the impact of Donald Trump's influence on that war? Well, I think you'll certainly see it beginning January 20th. I think the big question mark is, you know, Trump has made these promises that he's going to end the war in 24 hours, mm -hmm. but he's never said how. And certainly he can pressure Ukraine to make concessions to try to agree to a ceasefire in place with the Russians. But the issue is, why would the Russians agree? Because right now the Russian forces are actually advancing in Donetsk. And I'm sure from Putin's vantage point, he's looking at what's happening in Washington and saying, it's unlikely that a Republican Congress is going to continue funding Ukraine. So why would he be satisfied with only taking part of Ukraine? Why wouldn't he want to march on, on Kiev? And I think the challenge for Trump is going to be not just how to coerce Zelensky, but how do you coerce Putin? And I think the best way to do that, actually, would be to make clear that if Putin does not agree uh, to this, uh, to end the war, that Trump will radically increase weapons deliveries to Ukraine. That's mm. that's how he can actually create pressure for an actual settlement. But whether he'll do that or not, who knows? It's, I mean, great, great question. And on that point, Jill, I mean, Vladimir Putin offered his congratulations to Trump yesterday, which was his first public comment on the outcome. The way it was said is his behavior at the moment, he, part of what he said was his, meaning Trump, this is Putin talking, his behavior at the moment of an attempt on his life left an impression on me. He turned out to be a brave man. He manifested himself in the very correct way, bravely as a man. Though his spokesperson said just the day before that that he had no plans to congratulate Trump, saying, let us, Peskov saying, let's not forget that we are talking about an unfriendly country that is both directly and indirectly involved in the war against our state. Uh, what's going on here, Jill? Well, I think Putin is uh, playing around a little bit here. I think he's playing coy. Uh, he didn't immediately jump into congratulating Trump because I think Putin wants to show, you know, he is the president, he's a, a strong president of a country and he doesn't have to sit on pins and needles waiting for another election. But of course he wanted to congratulate Trump. And I think it's interesting the way he began to talk about Ukraine. You know, I'm open to discussing things and it's it bears listening to what the American soon to be president will say because uh, it would deal with dealing with Russia in order to solve Ukraine. And I think that's one of the problems. If Trump really wants a big win, which apparently he does, a big deal right at the beginning, then Ukraine is the perfect thing. So uh, tr Trump and, and Putin apparently, you know, could come together and say, well, let's solve it ourselves. Zelensky's never going to go for that. And Zelensky politically will have difficulty giving up any territory that Russia now holds. Yeah. And Max, I mean, you wrote about, I think it was just the, maybe the, a couple days before the election in one column, you wrote that if Trump were to win next week, he's likely to do great damage to the U.S. military just when, it's, when it is needed more than ever to protect the United States and its allies from looming threats abroad. And just this morning, I thought about this because this morning I also saw in the Washington Post new reporting that the Pentagon is preparing for anticipating a major upheaval now. I mean, that could be in, all, in many aspects, but also including the fear of will he follow through on the threat and promise of using the U.S. military on American citizens to root out the enemy from within? I mean, what do you think this could mean for the military? Well, it certainly creates huge dangers to military professionalism and their apolitical nature if he in fact demands personal loyalty from generals, as he said that he wants, or if he uses the military uh, against the quote unquote enemy from within. And you could imagine the military being used as part of these roundups of undocumented migrants that, that Trump has threatened. And there could be massive protests after that. You could imagine the 
Trump demanding the military be deployed for those purposes. I think this is a very perilous moment for the U.S. military, and I think it's going to be very important who Trump appoints as Secretary of Defense, who the Senate confirms. I hope it will be somebody who is uh, pretty mainstream and moderate, understands the need to keep the military out of politics, understands the need uh, for the military to respect the Constitution and not simply to follow orders, whatever they may be. And I think it's going to it's going to be a time of testing. I think for for leaders of the military, such as they haven't seen at least since the last Trump term. And, and Jill, when it comes to the relationship between Trump and Putin, and what it's really going to be this time around, I mean, we've heard Donald Trump for years since he since well during his time and when he left office, just heaping compliments on how. Putin rules, you know, and it's not just when it, not just Ukraine, it's the impact in Syria, it's Iran, it's North Korea. So what are you watching for to find out how this really is going to go, this relationship? Well, you know, looking at Putin, um, yes, of course, Russia wanted uh, Trump to win. There's no question. But that said, I don't think that Putin looks at Trump as at all predictable. Um, there is a kind of a strain of saying, well, you know, we're still at war with the United States right now over Ukraine. And there's, there's a little bit, I don't 10% maybe, of lack of trust of what Trump will actually do because he has reversed himself in some, in some ways. So I think I'm going, to watch, uh, I'm going to watch Putin and what he says literally because he always hints at certain major things by talking directly about them. So it's going to be extremely interesting to watch. I don't think there's a lot of trust either on um, on Putin's side. Yeah. Jill, great to see you. Thank you. Max, it's great to see you as well. Thank you very much. During a forum in Sochi, President Putin also said he'd be willing to talk to Donald Trump because his comments on Russia's war in Ukraine deserve attention. However, the Kremlin downplayed earlier claims by Trump that under his leadership, the war could be quickly resolved. Proposed something in order to solve the Ukrainian crisis even before his inauguration. Of course, there was a little bit over exaggeration that he would be able to do it overnight. Uh, certainly, there, there's nothing that can heal this problem overnight. See, this reply given is following all of this live from Berlin. I guess what we've got here is if President Trump is going to find some sort of negotiated solution, then the both sides need to get their positions clear before they go into that. Yeah, they certainly do. And I think one of the things that uh, pre uh, President-elect Trump touted uh, before he uh, was elected and certainly in that uh, meeting that he had in September with Volodymyr Zelensky uh, of Ukraine is that he believes that he can find a quick end to the war in Ukraine. You just heard Dmitry Peskov, the spokesman for the Kremlin there, saying that he doesn't believe that there is going to be a quick end, that all that is uh, exaggerated and certainly not realistic, uh, definitely by the way that things are going on the battlefield. But that's the thing that Donald Trump has said. He says he has good relations with Volodymyr Zelensky and he has good relations with Vladimir Putin as well. And yesterday certainly was a pretty e interesting evening, uh, Max, when we saw Vladimir Putin for hours speaking there at the 20th anniversary of the Valde Club uh, in uh, Sochi, where he did then say that he found uh, Donald Trump interesting uh, as, uh, as the president-elect, that he would be willing to listen to him. And it was specifically the fact that Donald Trump had said that he wants to end the war in Ukraine as fast as possible, uh, that uh, Vladimir Putin said that it would make him worth listening to. It was one of those interesting sort of exchanges towards the end of that evening where he was asked whether or not he'd be willing to, uh, to speak to Donald Trump. He said yes, he would. But Vladimir Putin also saying that he would not initiate that conversation. And in general, he said that if Western states want to normalize their relations with Russia, that Russia is willing to listen. But it certainly didn't appear as though Russia would be willing to make the first step. So that sort of sets somewhat or appears to somewhat set the framework under which something like that uh, could happen. It was also the first time, by the way, Max, that uh, Vladimir Putin congratulated Donald Trump on his election victory. You'll recall that right after it became clear that Donald Trump had enough electoral votes to become president of the United States, that we heard from the Russian Federation that there was um, uh, uh, that, that uh, Vladimir Putin was not planning to congratulate Donald Trump, at least officially. Now that happened at that Valda forum, although, of course, there was, as we know, no official call between the two. All of this, uh, Max, was going on as uh, at almost the same time Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine was at a summit in Hungary, in Budapest, where he was warning European leaders of what he calls 
hugs with Vladimir Putin, which he said had brought absolutely nothing to the European continent, uh, continent over the past 20 years, and that the war, of course, very much is still ongoing. And one of the things that we have to point out is that despite uh, the rhetoric from Donald Trump, the war in Ukraine, of course, still very much in full swing. The Ukrainians right now, especially on the Eastern Front, under a lot of pressure. And if we look at just overnight tonight, once again, a massive drone and missile attack that happened by the Russians on Ukrainian infrastructure, on Ukrainian towns. Uh, and so right now, definitely a very difficult situation to try and negotiate something. But again, Donald Trump, of course, saying he believes that he could do that. The Ukrainians very skeptical of that. And the Ukrainians also quite concerned about some of the comments that they heard from Donald Trump insinuating that military to aid to Ukraine could be cut, especially those by J.D. Vance, who essentially was reflecting exactly the points that the Kremlin has been making over the past uh, almost three years, Max. Fred Plankin, thank you.